स्थापकाय चर्मस्वूपिणे अवतार वरिष्ठाय राम कृष्णा ते नम वसुदेव सुत कंसचानूरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्णम वंदे जगत गुरु so now we will continue with the section in which we concluded in the last class it is the 64th shloka the 64th verse of the second chapter of bhagavad gita where bhagwan says that a person who is beyond the likes and dislikes which is the product of raga dvesha attachment and aversion from attachment come likes from aversion dislikes so the one who has transcended that who has gone beyond attach attachment and aversion and correspondingly to the likes and dislikes such a person alone can attain tranquility and serenity that's what bhagwan has indicated in the 64th shloka the 64th verse of the second chapter so what it says raga dvesha vyukta istu vishayan indriyaischaran atma vashyair vidhe atma prasadam adhigachati that a man of self control vidhe atma vidhe atma means a man of self control <coughs> vidhe atma that one who has controlled his own self when he is moving among the objects of the senses vishayan indriyais charan so he is moving among the object of senses but he has established <clears throat> that equanimity how by going beyond the likes and dislikes he is neither attached to the things which are apparently pleasurable he is neither have hatred to the things which are apparently unpleasurable so he moves around them without being affected by them <clears throat> so that's what is being indicated by the term raga dvesha vyukta istu vishayan indriya ischara this vyukta vyukta means to get detached from raga and dvesha from attachment and aversion then what happens atma vashyair vidhe atma so the one has who has thus developed that self restraint this atma his own self is in his own vasha is his own control atma vashyair vidhe atma such a self restraint person for him alone that the serenity of mind is attainable there is no other way we can attain the serenity of mind so as we were speaking in the last class that it speaks of developing psychological immunity just as in our body we have to develop immunity now it is this term immunity has become very common with the prevalent of this covid infection we find everywhere you go this the speak of that we have to grow immunity because we have almost no control over the external environment the germs are there the all the viruses are there all don't get infected in the same way why it depends on the power of immunity so to think of the external world <clears throat> totally favorable where the things which i like is not in my presence the things to which <coughs> sorry 
the things to which i am inordinately attached is not in my presence and the things which i hate they are also not in my presence to think of such a laboratory condition but i am as if in a laboratory where all the favorable conditions has been set in is not possible in this physical world that nowadays we find the criticism that the media has become all pervasive how to protect ourselves everywhere we find that the media through the media it is trying to distract us how to save ourselves so there again that same thing we have to understand that vishayan indriya charan that this will be there the world will go on its own way i have no control over that my integrity depends on how i develop that psychological immunity that let them be in my present when it is possible to avoid them of course i will avoid i will not as if uh, invite myself to all those circumstances to prove that i am not in any way attached by them that's not the intention wherever it's possible of course i will avoid but in this life we will find that in spite of all our sincere attempt to <clears throat> to be away from the sensed pleasures of life we have to be with them <clears throat> we have to move around in this world that's what is sthita pragya does he is moving around in this world that you will uh, if you remember that arjuna asks three questions <clears throat> that how does a sthita pragya behave himself that kim asit vrajet kim that when he is with himself how he conducts and when he is moving around with the people how he is conduct he how he conducts himself so this is the answer <clears throat> to that question that when he is moving around he cannot keep himself only in that ideal laboratory condition when he is moving around in this world he has to interact how he is behaving so there he has developed that capacity to not be affected by the so called likes and dislikes a man of strong likes and dislike can never attain peace in life the like and dislike both we have to remember that attachment of course distracts us there is no need to explain that even hatred hatred is a negative attraction you will find the thing which i love that drags my mind that keeps my mind engaged with the object of love but the ob- thing which i hate we will find sometimes more intensely it engages my mind so it is an attraction in a negative way so both are distracting us then what's the way out here bhagwan is of course saying that i have to keep myself detached but it's not easy just as someone instructs me be detached from raga dvesha how can i keep myself detached because when i am with the objects of the senses my mind naturally is drawn towards it i am helpless so for that a faculty has to be developed and that throughout the bhagavad gita in this shloka he is just indicating that you have to go beyond the raga dvesha but throughout the bhagavad gita in the later chapters you will find that what's the way out so he will be speaking in the 18th chapter not only in the 18th chapter there are many places but in the 18th chapter the concluding chapter in he is speaking of manmana bhava mad bhakto mad yaji mam namaskur always think of me manmana bhava let your mind be constantly contemplating on me mad bhakta be my devotee if you find your emotive faculty is disturbing you because by getting engaged in the inordinate attachments try to bring it out from there and engage in me try to be emotively engaged with me through devotion that's mad bhakto mad yaji if you have to relate to someone in a worshipful attitude in this world so many things we adore if you really have to adore adore me mad yaji mam namaskaru bow down to me 
So what it is speaking of? Sri Ramakrishna used to say a very interesting thing that Michri Mishtir Muddhino that sugar candy is not to be considered as sweet. Why? In Ayurveda, they say <clears throat> that sugar, generally all the things uh, which are having a lot of sugar contents, all the food, they increase the acidity. But in Ayurveda, it is, uh, <clears throat> it is prescribed that when the sugar has been crystallized to form sugar candy, that sugar candy, when you put it in water, that water, that water which, in which the sugar candy has been diluted, you drink it, it acts as an antacid. It cools down your digestive system. So that's why Sri Ramakrishna used to say that sugar candy is not to be considered as sweet because like though the sweet, any other sweet, is the result is acidity. This is the thing which is just contrary. It, like, it acts like an antacid. That's what is being spoken of in Ayurveda. <clears throat> the same thing happens with devotion. Now devotion is also a raga. Devotion to God is also an attachment. A devotee is very much attached to God. But that attachment is not to be considered as raga. When Bhagavan is saying raga desha vyukta istu that be detached from Raga and Dvesha. <clears throat> we have to be detached from the Raga and Dvesha as per our attachment to this worldly, sensate world is concerned, not to God. That for that, Bhagavan himself has instructed throughout the Bhagavad Gita that be devoted to me. Why? That how it helps? As Sri Ramakrishna used to say, that's the only way to develop detachment. I cannot forcefully detach myself. In the words of Ramakrishna, he used to say very nicely that <clears throat> if there is a, that uh, on the scar, when it is healing, so the scab which develops over the scar, if you forcefully remove that, the scar will lacerate. Let it fall off naturally. So we cannot force renunciation. We cannot just, uh, that whatever is, uh, in order to be pulling me, I just force myself out of it. I will be harming myself. I will be developing a lot of psychological complications. So that's not the way, not subjugation, but sublimation. Develop love for something sublime so that the other trivial love, all those inordinate attachment which speaks of our attachment to something trivial, they fall off naturally. The more you go towards the east, the more west falls behind. That's the simple words of Ramakrishna. The same idea which is spoken of in Bhagavad Gita. That more you develop devotion for the Lord, the attachment for other things falls off naturally. So it speaks of sublimation. That's the way we can get rid of our inordinate raga attachment and aversion. How it works in psychology? The same thing as whenever the context comes, we bring the discussion back. You will find the same discussion we have discussed, the same point we have discussed in some other context. Let us bring that discussion again in this context. That Raga Dvesha, how we develop inordinate attachment towards anything. If you see the functioning of the mind, you will find that how we have developed inordinate attachment or aversion <clears throat> that in the process of evolution, we have just uh, what we have done out of necessity whenever we were pursuing something. But out of necessity, we were trying to get something. In the process of doing it again and again, out of necessity, what I do today, when I do it again and again, a path is as if created in my mind. My mind gets wired. Once the mind gets wired, I forget the necessity. Just doing it becomes my obsession. Even hatred also. I will just give two examples. That rag, that how have we have the developed this, uh, um, this inordinate liking for sweet because the Evolutionary scientists have 
already discovered the fact that as the food gatherers, when we were procuring, our ancestors were procuring food in the forest. What they were doing, they were in search of food, they were collecting sweet, they were always in search of sweet fruits, sweet herbs, sweet fruits. Why? They discovered that other taste, apart from sweet, the other taste, there is doubt. It may be toxic, it may nourish. If anything is sour, if anything is bitter, they may be toxic, they may be nourishing. But sweet is invariably, in nature, anything sweet is invariably going to nourish you. It's not going to kill you. So out of necessity, they were in search of sweet fruit, sweet herbs. And in the process, as we were doing it repeatedly for generations, our mind got wired. That, that wired uh, this, uh, function of the mind is transmitted through the genes. It has got so strongly wired. And as it has got wired, we have developed inordinate attachment. We forgot the necessity. So now we will find that the, one of the main cause of all the lifestyle diseases is too much intake of sugar. In all the food, that hidden sugar is, is the cause of all the disease. So just see how the necessity got converted into inordinate attachment. Not only that, I forgot, I'm just not remembering the exact name, anorexia, yeah. Many of you have heard of anorexia. <clears throat> it's a psychological disease. What's that? That you know that nowadays that to maintain the figure, sometimes many will be resorting to that extreme dieting. They won't take food at all. So it's out of necessity they are avoiding food. That aversion can also become a compulsion. It can also become an obsession. The same process is followed. That when I am out of necessity, what that I have to keep myself that fit, not only it's not fitness actually, sometimes craze for to be slim. I'm avoiding food, avoiding food. At the beginning, there's a necessity that, okay, that for maintaining my figure, I'm avoiding food. After some time, that becomes an obsession. They will not take even the optimum amount of food required to maintain his body. They become skin and bones. They have to be admitted to the hospital and forcefully through drip, the food has to be given. And there are extreme cases and extreme cases. There are many cases of death because of the psychological, the psychological disease where you have developed total aversion for food to the extent that you are not even taking the optimum amount of food to maintain your health. So just see how our brain is tricking us. There's a limitation. It takes us spirally downwards. That raga, dvesha, both are compulsions. These both are the compulsions, please come. These both are compulsions. How to come out of it? So when I am trying to have devotion towards God, which is a sublime, what you say, there's something sublime. Now, this is a something wonderful that when I'm trying to develop devotion, what's here also, I am actually resorting to that limitation of the mind that what you do again and again, it creates a path in my mind. So at the beginning, most probably it, you require a willpower. I take a resolution with that resolution. I try to contemplate on the divine. At manmana bhava mad bhakta. Throughout my day, whatever I'm doing, I'm trying to keep my mind on the, on the divine. It's not easy. It gets distracted. Again, I try. This repeated attempt brings at last something called the devotion. If you try to be manmana, you are bound to be madhbhakto. The devotion, why? The mind is following the same thing because of that wiring. Once that wiring is done, it now develops the love. Well, this love is something qualitatively different from all other inordinate attachments and aversions. That raga, dvesha, both are the product of compulsion, just as now we were discussing. We can get rid of this two, this raga and dvesha for all worldly things 
with the love of God. You may say, how? In my mind at present, I find that when I have developed an attachment for a thing, and again, I develop attachment for something else, both coexist. There are so many attachments in my mind coexisting. Why not my love for God also co can coexist with the others? That you are saying when you develop love for God, the other love falls off. In the Bhagavad Gita itself, we will find in some other, in a very interesting way, this idea has been discussed. What happens as this love is qualitatively different? Its quality is different from all other attachment. How? We will under, easily understand that all our love, our attachments, which I have developed through the process of evolution, depends on something external. In your life, you just find out that uh, my love as per my relations are concerned, my love as per the wealth is concerned, my love as per my name and fame is concerned. Everything is depending on something external. The one whom I love, if he or she doesn't reciprocate the love, my love is of no use. It is going to be a failure. I cannot have that relationship. The wealth I want to earn, if I am not successful, I cannot get it the name and fame, the position, everything. They, it depends on the external circumstances. I may get it, I may not get it. So there is always concern related to all our endeavors as per the external uh, <clears throat> uh, objects of desires are concerned. All the objects, are uh, objects of desire are extraneous. So there's always concern that I may not get it. <clears throat> Throughout the life, we have experienced that. that so many things we want, that fear is there, I may not get it. And once we get it, again the fear is there, I may lose it. The same thing, whether it is relation, whether it is wealth, whether it is name and fame. So in Bhagavad Gita, the two words have been used in much later. Yoga, Kshema. Yoga is not in the spiritual sense. Yoga means union. So here, the word yoga, which we are using in the context of gathering, getting the external objects of desire, means my union with the object of my desire. So that is yoga. Kshema means to maintain. So always with all our likes and dislikes, there is always concern related to the yoga to get it and to preserve it. Kshema. But this new love by repeated spiritual practice, by using my willpower, I am trying to be man mana. You are bound to be mad bhakta. And what happens after some time, because of repeated practice, you are creating a path in your mind. Once the path is created, once you have wired that mind in this new way, this is something qualitatively different from all other love. How? This new love is not depending on, is not dependent on something external. That when I just sit down or when I am contemplating on the God, it doesn't depend on any external factor. No one can take it away from me. As in one of the Miraz Bhajan, that famous lines are there. That what this love is, what's the nature of this love? Kharche nahi koi, chor na leve, dina dina varat savayo. Kharche nahi koi. It never gets expended. Other your wealth may get expended, your name and fame you will be lost, your relations may be again lost, but this is the thing, it never gets expended. No one can steal it from you. The more you practice, the more intense, the more you practice, the more deep groove you create in your mind, the more intense becomes your love. So dina dina varata savayo. So we have created a path which is not dependent on something external. So as a result, what happened? All the concerns related to yoga and kshema, whether I will get it and once I get it, can I preserve it? That fear is no more there in this, in this new love. is the only love in life which you have designed. All others were by through default. This is the thing you have designed. No one can take away from you. And once you, the more you practice, the more intense it becomes the love. So now you will understand that you have created a path in the mind 
where there is no interactions, there is no interjections, there is no crossing, there is no question of traffic. Whenever my object of love is something extraneous, there is always question of clash. My interest may clash with yours. That's what we find in the world, which results in jealousy, which results in fight, which results in turmoil, which results in all sorts of external turbulence and of course by inner turbulence. Because there's a lot of traffic. My interest is clashing with others. Here I have created an interest which is like a freeway. When I have developed love for God, you can develop love for God in any way. It is not interacting. Yes, I can love, you can love. No, no harm in it. My love in no way is going to hamper your love. Or as you are loving, in no way I'm going to miss the object of my love. It is something sublime. That's why Sri Ramakrishna used to say that moon is everyone's moon. That in, you know, that when the children are growing up, the mothers in that in the all our in the olden days, they will point out, the grandparents will point to the moon and say, That is your uncle. So Ramakrishna is indicating that in a funny way by saying that just the way the moon is everyone's uncle, God is everyone's own. That by making God your own in no way. Is taking away God from others. So he's the object of universal love. That's we understand. And that love, once you develop, there is no question of the fear of losing. You always have it with you. So you have developed a freeway where there is no interaction with others. So there's no concern. So when you have developed a love, which is in no way there is concern that it is with me, no one can take it away from me. My mind's natural tendency will be to traverse through that path. Why should I traverse through the path which is full of traffic, which is full of turmoil, conflicts? That previously there was no freeway. There was only this road which was going through the traffic. I had no other way. I have to travel. Mind cannot sit in one place. It has to travel. So it was bound to travel, though it was getting again and again this a lot of kicks, a lot of uh, shocks still there was no way it had to go but once through design you have created this freeway mind's natural tendency is to traverse through that why should we go through the other paths so now you will understand when Bhagavan is saying raga desha vyukta it doesn't mean that you even don't develop raga for God it is something which is not included in this that's why throughout Bhagavad Gita again and again he will saying will be saying Manmana bhava, that you get rid of ragadvesha in relation to the world, not with me. Manmana bhava, mad bhakta, mad yaji, maam namashkuru. So now you may say, and another interesting thing, that I have developed the love for God and it is so uh, strong that the other love has fallen off. Then what's the way my worldly needs will be taken care of? Bhagavan has assured in Bhagavad Gita that if you become like that, when you really have your love of God is so strong that you cannot take care of your worldly needs, then God will provide you the yoga shema. He will not only provide you, he will carry it for you. So that's the assurance he has given that yoga shema vahamyaham. Just the way, you just see the plan of the universe. A small child, when he's born, he's helpless. God has provided the love in the parent, in the elderly, to take care of the child. He doesn't have to think. Whenever you are helpless because uh, that, uh, that just like a child, know it for certain, the plan of the universe is such, you will be taken care of. God will carry, that he's assuring Bhagavad Gita, that it's not only he will provide, just as if like your servant, he will carry for you all the things which you need and then preserve for you, yoga kshema. So that's the state which has been spoken of here. A realized soul, one who is sthita pragya. So you can become sthita pragya only when you have into that realization. Your wisdom has become steady. You're totally dependent on the divine. All the likes and dislikes has fallen off. God will take care of you. When the Ramakrishna organization was formed, it's Holy Mother's prayer that how the sadhus 
will survive. Have they just to go around just begging? She prayed that see that in your name, in Ramakrishna's name, this have came out. Just it is the mother. The mother is praying that just see that they don't have the dearth of minimum clothing and shelter and food. Just the basic thing. It is provided. The prayer of the divine is there. When Narendra Nath, you know, there's very interesting stories are there. When Narendra's father died, Swami Vivekananda's father died, he, uh, uh, he, there was tremendous financial difficulties he was going through. That uh, for days together, he won't have food so that, that the, he can save, uh, save his share for the family. And as it became almost unbearable, he never knew that how he can maintain his family after the death of his father. One day he told Ramakrishna that you are mother's devotee. You, you, whatever you pray for, mother grants you. Why not you pray that for my sustenance so that I can just uh, maintain my family. And then Ramakrishna told that as Narendra Nath, as a young Narendra Nath, we find he used to go to Brahma Samaj. He believed in the formless aspect of God initially. So he always used to censor this idol worship. So that's why Ramakrishna immediately is retorting back and saying, Narendra, that you don't believe in uh, mother. What can I do? You, if you have the belief, then you yourself go and pray. I can assure you, I'm, I'm assuring you, if you go and whatever you ask, it, it was an auspicious day for the mother. He told a very interesting thing. You go and whatever you ask, the mother will grant you. This is a very interesting story. You know that it can be related to this type of, this, uh, this locus. When Naren, being directed by Ramakrishna, went through the Kali temple, seeing the divine mother, she felt that, he felt that she is living. And in his presence, the moment he was about to pray, he felt very uh, that ashamed that how can I ask for these small pretty things? He told that, give me jnana, give me bhakti, give me vairagya, all these spiritual qualities he asked, came back. Ramakrishna asked, did you ask that, uh, the mother for your sustenance, for a little wealth? He said, I forgot. No, what type of person you are? I just told you, whatever you ask will be granted. Go again. He goes for the second time. And again, the presence of the mother was overwhelming. Again, he forgets. Again, the same thing. He asks only for this viveka, vairagya, jnana, knowledge, bhakti, and all those spiritual qualities. Comes back, again rebuked by Ramakrishna. Again, he goes. The third time, again, the same thing happens. This time, he feels very much ashamed that this time, as already twice he has failed, this time he was not overwhelmed. He thought, let me really ask. But again, he felt ashamed. How can I ask for such pitiable things in front of the Divine Mother? He again prayed for Jnana Bhakti, came back. And then he, then he told his helplessness that he cannot pray for such trivial things. And then what Ramakrishna is saying that again speaks of Yoga Kshema Vahamyam. That when is somehow your love for the divine has, has enabled you to transcend this, all these so-called inordinate attachments and hatreds for the things with which our worldly uh, existence is involved, then God takes care. Ramakrishna at last, what he's saying now, what Narendra asked for, that's what Ramakrishna is saying. That I pray to the mother that let there not be the, any dearth for the minimum. It's not that your uh, relatives will live in luxury. The minimum sustenance that will be taken care of. And it was taken care of till the, even after Swami Vivekananda passed away. His mother was still living. There are so many interesting stories. The Raja of Khetri. Yes, uh, when Swamiji was alive, Raja of Khetri was also alive. Raja of Khetri is to send money every month to uh, Bhuvaneshwari Devi, Vivekananda's mother. And in those days, you know, that the, somehow the, that, you know, the minimum sustenance came. It was not that they were rich, but she was just having the, 
amenities for the minimum sustenance, fomenting the family. In the there's so very interesting stories are there. When the Raja of Khetri is to send the money, uh, the stories are interesting. In those days, it is to it is to be sent by post, and there is to be a lot of theft. Means uh, things were to this. The if there is some money in the envelope that was taken away, the empty envelope will come. So what Raja of Khetri is to do is very interesting. He will cut the uh, this currency note into two pieces. He will send half of the piece, and and uh, when it reaches, there has to be an acknowledgement. The Bhuvaneshwari Devi has to acknowledge, send an acknowledgement. I have got, and then the other half of the note was sent, and these two halves she is to take to the bank, and show that this somehow this uh, this uh, rupee currency note has been destroyed, and she is to get a fresh note. So. Just I'm just saying that uh, that she that the sustenance was going on I means throughout the life somehow the minimum sustenance that was maintained. Mota bhat kapore abhav habena yoga kshemam vaham yam. So this speaks a wonderful thing which has been spoken of that istita pragya who has that developed so much love for the divine that all the raga dvesha has fallen off. There's no more concern. Is a God who takes care of it. He simply lives this life with that <clears throat> attaining that tranquility where all the likes and dislikes has fallen off. And that's the answer to Arjuna's question that how a man of realization, a man who is sthita dhi, whose dhi, whose uh, pragya, whose wisdom is stable, but never, he never wavers in his wisdom, how he moves around in this world. So that was the answer. So after this answer, the next naturally the question comes that once you attain the tranquility, what are the um, uh, effects of it? How it is going to affect my life in a positive way? That as we always say that even a fool cannot be motivated to do something if he doesn't know the result, can anyone will, will anyone be motivated to do the if an action has no result? Can we be motivated to do it? No. So what's the result if you have developed that tranquility? That will be described in the sixty-fifth sloka, the next sloka. That what's the outcome? That once you develop that tranquility, and these two things happen: prasade, the sixty-fifth sloka of the second chapter, prasade sarva dukkhanam. Hanir asya upajayate prasanna chetasa hi ashu buddhi pariyava tishthate. The two effects has been spoken of. The first line speaks of the first thing, uh, the first effect, and the second line speaks of the second effect that ensues when you develop the tranquility of mind. So when there is serenity, prasade, when there is serenity. When you have attained prasada, that's what is being indicated by the word prasade. What happens? Sarva dukkhanam hani asya upajayate. That all the suffering in life is eradicated in totality. Hani asya upajayate. Sarva dukkhana. The word sarva speaks of in totality. There cannot be any more suffering. The suffering falls off from your life. So sometimes uh, by happiness, we think something that is sense of elation. But in the scripture, the happiness is not spoken of as an elation. It is more spoken of as a tranquility. It's spoken of as a let go. We shouldn't uh, confuse the happiness which has been spoken of as the outcome of our spiritual wisdom with the happiness of worldly uh, censored pleasures. The worldly censored pleasures are in uh, that accompanied with the tintillation of the nerves and excitement. It is not this type of happiness. This, there's a difference between excitement and let go. Excitement at last ends in exhaustion. This let go gives that the sense of happiness, which has as if no ending. It's something which stays with you. So that type of happiness is attained when you go beyond the likes and dislikes. How it happens? As we have described this prasade sarva dukkhanam hani. Let us try to understand this first. 
that when you go beyond the likes and dislike, all the so-called suffering ends for me once for all. And I enjoy a type of placidness, a bliss, which ensues from let go. That all the likes and dislikes are like the various mental modules. Our mind is not just one mind. That each and every like and dislike, which we have developed through the process of evolution, they constitute a particular stimuli response conditioning and it becomes a subset of our mind. There are say various such subsets. And what's happening, constantly they are bubbling, each and all the subsets of mental modules, the small mental modules. That is not one mind, these innumerable mental modules constitute our mind. And they, that at a particular time, only one module gets activated. And for that module, the stimuli response conditioning is fixed. Whatever response is there for that stimuli that is going to happen, giving us a feeling I am deciding, but actually the module is deciding. We never take decision. And these modules, every all the modules want to be pampered. They, because at a time, only one module gets activated. They all want to be pampered. They all want to get activated. That's how they get nourished. And that's how the mind is always in turmoil. When I'm in default mode, when I'm just sitting quietly, then I can understand how pitiable my condition is. Suddenly one thought comes again from nowhere, another thought comes. And sometimes when I look at my mind, I'm puzzled. What a cauldron, as if this a hodgepodge of like the khichdi. So this mixture of so many things is happening there. It's been cooked there. It's a something, This it's a the cauldron of the hell that so much of this, uh, uh, this cooking is going on of various ideas constantly. Why? Because they all want to be pampered. This condition is like, as we give that example, that you feed birds. And in the morning when you feed the birds, you are just sitting outside with the grains and immediately all the birds come and all wants to be pampered, all wants to be fed all wants to draw your attention. So now you decide one day that I am not going to pamper them anymore. I won't feed them anymore. If I have to feed, I have to feed the divine, the new metal model which I have developed. This I won't feed anymore. So what happens after two days, three days, when they come because they have the expectation, these birds will come back. All the mental models will still try to disturb you. But as you have developed love for the divine, the other mental modules are not fed. In a short time, after a few, after a short duration, they will start falling off, rendering you free. This can be understood in another way. As we told that you have developed a new path in your mind, you start traversing that. You, have, you must have noticed when you go for a walk in the park, you are walking on the green lawn. Most probably previously you were walking, you used to just take a particular path. As you used to walk in that path, the green, that you will find that the grass dries and a path is created. That's how a path are created in the mind. Now, if you change your path, start walking in some another uh, route. And uh, after a few days, you will find as no one is walking in that old route, the grass again grows there. So same thing happens in my mind. If we are not that the previously wired paths in our mind, if we are not traversing there for quite long, they start getting erased because this new path as you are traversing again and again, they get erased. So in both the ways we can understand that as we are not feeding them, they are gradually becoming weak. They are getting the feedback that we won't be fed anymore. They fall off and these old paths gets dried, this old path again, gets uh, totally uh, deleted. And then what happens? For the first time, you enjoy a sense of lightness. These likes and dislikes were the thing, like a heavy weight I was carrying constantly. There was no way out. And I got so habituated with them that though I was suffering, sometimes I even don't realize that I'm suffering. I was habituated with that suffering. 
And for the first time, because of your love of the divine, when the other likes and dislikes has fallen off, suddenly you find that the weight has been taken away from you. Just imagine that you are carrying a baggage for days together. And the moment you keep down the baggage, what type of feeling you have? A tremendous relaxation. That, oh, what's a heavy weight. I got habituated with it. I was carrying. I, I never realized that I'm carrying the baggage. I realize it only when I keep it down. Then that sense of that relaxation, that let go ensues. So the same thing has been spoken of here. That when you go beyond the likes and dislikes, and when you attain that the tranquility, then all these things has fallen off. Sarva dukkhanam hani rasya upajayate. It takes you to that state of bliss, which doesn't speak of tintillation of nerves, not excitement, but the tranquility which comes from that uh, this, this uh, let go, which uh, let go, which ensues from the falling off of all the so-called inordinate attachments and aversions in life, the likes and dislikes. So that's the first result. You enjoy a bliss which you have never experienced before. That's the first thing. Second is prasanna chetaso hi ashu buddhi pariyava tishthate. That the wisdom of one who has a serene mind becomes wholly established. This is a very important thing. That in our day-to-day life, we all, even in this, we're living in this life, we want these two things. We want happiness and we want wisdom. Why? That in each and every phase of our life, stage of our life, we find that we are baffled with our decision. Sometimes in retrospect, we repent, oh, the decision we took was not correct. So here, when you are tranquil, you know it for certain, your buddhi becomes wholly established. You can never take a faltering step. Why it happens? That your, you become established in wisdom. You, you enjoy bliss. And at the same time, you start, uh, you get established in wisdom. You find not only in your spiritual life, even in your day-to-day life, in all the situations that your decision speaks of wisdom, how it happens with the tranquility of mind. Again, what happens? All the bias falls off. Our likes and dislikes speaks of our biases. And this bias never allow us to take the correct decision. We are already biased because of our likes and dislikes. Our likes and dislikes is our, this our bias colors our world. Because of our likes and dislikes, we develop the bias and that taints our world. That's the example which we give again and again. That in Vedanta, that very famous example, that how our bias taints our vision, distorts our vision. That there is a stump in the corner of a park. A tree which has died, only the stump is there. In the twilight hours, in the dusk, when it's, uh, the light, it is not well lighted, a small child, his game is over. Most probably mother is waiting somewhere, uh, sitting on, in a bench in the park, waiting for the child to come back. Now the child is in search of the mother. His play game is over. From a distance, it sees the stump and thinks it should be the mother because its mind is already biased. It's in search of its mother. The mother is in search of the child that when the child will come back, the game is over. From a distance, she sees the stump and she thinks it should be the child. The lover is in search of the beloved. She, he or she thinks it to be the beloved. A police is running away from the thief. The police, uh, the thief sees it to be the police. The police sees it to be the thief. So as per the bias, the stump, which is a stump, is being envisioned so differently, is being perceived so differently. So this speaks our, our bias distorts our vision. You don't see the thing correctly. And as I don't see the thing correctly, how can I take the decision? So we have to get rid of the bias. There's another interesting story which Sri Ramakrishna says of chess players. Two are playing the chess and third is the onlooker. They are all, of course, not professionals. Just they are amateurs. They're playing. 
and the you will find always the onlooker he says the he or she says the correct move the one who are playing they are faltering it may give you an impression that the one who is an onlooker is a most probably skilled player now the role changes the one who was onlooker he starts playing or she starts playing and the one who was playing he becomes the onlooker and now you will notice a wonderful thing the one who was saying the correct move the moment he starts playing he or she will be faltering the one who was playing and now is on looker now is saying the correct move why it happens because those who are playing their mind is having full of expectations again the bias is working that i have to win the fear of losing is there i shouldn't lose i have to win so 80% 90% of the mind is clouded with all those anticipations expectations worries he cannot give the mind totally on the game the one who is the onlooker has nothing to do with the winning or losing his mind is totally focused on the game that speaks of the wisdom the more you are tranquil the more the bias falls off the more the likes and dislike falls off the more the tranquil is your mind the more focused it is the more it is giving attention to the thing on which it is supposed to give and then that speaks of the wisdom as someone asked einstein that what's the secret behind your intelligence he his answer was very interesting very significant he told the thing which i think importance be important i give lot of time for it means my total energy is involved in that lot of time just go on thinking over it thinking over it everything else falls off and the knowledge automatically comes so the more we are focused the more the knowledge comes the more and for the focus the tranquility of mind is important without the tranquility the bias never falls off and without the bias our visions can never be distorted so this speaks of this second factor that first is that to let go and choose you enjoy a state of bliss and the second your decisions are no more faltering you get established in wisdom just see that it is speaking of something which is not which of course has spiritual implications but it do have implications in our day to day life so how meditation can help that through meditation when i can develop love for god it's not something mere spiritual even in our day to day life we will find that i am more equipped to face the challenges of life and that's what bhagavad gita is arjuna was trying to flee god has brought him back again to fight the battle to face the circumstances of life and then he is propounding gita so bhagavad gita is not a scripture to run away it is to face the challenges of life with the spirituality the spirituality is not to run away the spiritual is to face the challenges of life and you face it in a much much better way that's why swami brahmananda used to say that give the mind to god three fourth of mind to god and with one fourth mind take a, take care of the worldly activities know it for certain that is more than enough so that's the thing is being indicated that you get that wisdom just when it is the your entire three fourth of your mind is given to the divine that one fourth mind that tranquil mind that one fourth mind is sufficient to take care of all the things with wisdom so this lord confirms this idea that what he has spoken of this you have bliss and you attain wisdom the bliss and the wisdom these two things you attain when you attain tranquility by going beyond the likes and dislikes in the 65th shloka he is saying in the 66th and the 67th he will say he will confirm to this idea by saying that if it doesn't happen that if you don't attain the tranquility then neither you attain bliss nor you attain wisdom that neither you attain bliss will be spoken of in the 66th shloka the next shloka and the 67 speaks the next 67 shloka will speak that you won't attain wisdom so the 66 shloka so let us just read this shloka we will go through the literal meaning of it we will go to the discussion again in the next class nasti buddhir ayuktasya na cha yuktasya bhavana na cha bhavayata shantihi 
अशांतस्य कुतः सुखम न अस्ति बुद्धि अयुक्तस्य वन हु इज अयुक्त हुज माइंड इज नॉट युक्त इज नॉट कनेक्टेड टू द ऑब्जेक्ट इन व्हिच इट इज सपोज टू बी कनेक्टेड अयुक्त युक्त मींस टू गेट कनेक्टेड so nasti buddhir ayuktas the mind the mind, person whose mind is not under his control he has neither wisdom concerning the self nasti buddhir ayuktasya not the faculty of contemplation or meditation that's nacha yuktasya bhavana this bhavana is a word which we have to understand what it speaks of nacha bhavayata shanti nacha अभावयत शांति अशांत कुत सुखम एंड विदाउट कॉन्टेम्पलेशन ही कैन हैव नो पीस एंड विदाउट पीस देर कैन नॉट बी हैपीनेस सो दिस इज सम सीक्वेंस हैज बीन स्पोकन ऑफ दैट वेन यू दिस ऑप्टेन हैपीनेस हाउ यू ऑप्टेन दैट हैपीनेस दिस इज सीक्वेंस एंड इफ दैट सीक्वेंस इज नॉट फॉलो यू डोंट गेट द हैपीनेस सो फर्स्ट दे आर सेंग न अस्ति बुद्धि अयुक्त सो विदाउट डेवलपिंग द फैकल्टी ऑफ कंट्रोलिंग द माइंड यू कैन नेवर हैव प्रॉपर विचार डिस्क्रिमिनेशन सो यू बुद्धि मीन्स द माइंड हैज दिस वेरियस फैकल्टीज एज पर द वेरियस फंक्शन ऑफ द माइंड द माइंड हैज बीन डिवाइडेड इन टू मन बुद्धि अहंकार चित्त दिस आर द फोर एस्पेक्ट चित्त इज द स्टोर हाउस ऑफ ऑल योर इंप्रेशन अहंकार इज दैट दैट एस्पेक्ट ऑफ द माइंड दैट पार्ट ऑफ द माइंड विच गिव्स यू द सेंस ऑफ ईगो दैट आई एम दिस बॉडी माइंड कॉम्प्लेक्स अहंकार मन मीन्स दिस मन इज अ पार्ट ऑफ द मन दिस मन विस ऑफ दिस संकल्प विकल्पात्मक मन दैट इन माई माइंड देर आर सो मेनी ऑप्शन आर देर i may do a thing in a one way i may do may not do it at all or i may do it in some other way that is this in sanskrit they say kartum akartum anyatha kartum so all these options are there from those all those options i take a particular i just choose a discriminate a particular option to be followed that speaks of the buddhi that is nischayatmika that i am convinced of all these options this is the best one so just as we told that unless your biases have fallen off you cannot choose the correct one your biases will distort your vision so that's being mentioned by that na asti buddhi ayuktasya and when your buddhi is not you have not pick, pick, picked up the correct decision there cannot be bhavana na cha yuktasya bhavana what what that speaks of very interesting just give me a, let us give a example that a student is very interested in biology and he thinks bah as i like biology let me become doctor let me become a doctor let me choose a professional course of medical science and now when he goes to them the profession of the studies of medical science most probably when he studying then also already the practical starts he has to go to the hospital he has to deal with the patients now he realizes one thing that reading the biology in the textbook and to be in the hospital with all those patients who are suffering you can see blood you can see that the, the environment which gives you a, your head starts reeling you never were prepared to face that situation so reading the thing in a book and to be in a situation is different and now you find that the professional study which i have chosen was most probably not for me now all the focus with which you have went there is suddenly gone it happens with many that sometimes in our day to day life it happens in all the profession that the interest as a student which we have when we are i am in the profession then i suddenly feel this profession was not for me and then you find that all the focus which you had you cannot keep it there somehow you are dragging with it that all that passion behind it has gone so when your decision is not correct you cannot have 
the decision that you cannot continue with the decision with bhavana bhavana means it's like nididhyasana that once you have developed a conviction you live on that conviction your your life is rotates around that conviction so that can never happen because the decision itself you have taken wrong because of your inordinate attachment so now how can you live with that contemplation so that speaks of bhavana na cha yuktasya bhavana that you cannot live with that distorted conviction you thought that this is a thing it is going to be uh, ideal for me and now you don't find it's not ideal how can you live with that so na bha na abhav na cha abha na cha abhav ayata shanti and now you find there is no peace of mind because the thing which you have decided upon you find is was not for you so where will you get peace ashantasya kuta sukham that there can be happiness this is slokas are wonderful and it just speaks means you know the why bhagavad gita is so appealing you will feel that each with bhagwan is addressing arjuna but when we read it we will find that he is addressing me he is addressing me each and everyone is bound to feel that he is addressing me and that makes it so appealing so even from our day to day life we find this shloka is something wonderful it is speaking that throughout our life because of our inordinate attachments we take a decision which we think is going to be uh, what you say that is going to build my life i am going to flourish because of this decision and then i find the decision i was i have taken was actually not meant for me i won't say wrong it was not meant for me and now i find that i am dragging with that existence i cannot have bhavana i cannot live with it that ideal cannot make can no more become my passion and as it cannot can become my passion as i am dragging there can there cannot be any peace and as there is no peace how can there be real bliss in life is constantly that that it is nagging so just how wonderfully bhagwan is dealing with our psychology it has a spiritual implication also that this uh, what we try to understand we understood the, uh, we try to understand this shloka from our secular perspective from the spiritual perspective also it has a very significant meaning that we will take up we will continue with this shloka and take up the spiritual aspect of it again in the next class with this we stop our discussion today thank you all namaskar yeah please um, so um, you need, uh,